number one, the fire. And it's kind of weird because I know it's kind of played out in movies and stuff, but I actually have a Cabin in the Woods story. It happened in the summer after my first year of college. My friends rented a cabin, and we were going to rough it out there for a couple of weeks. It was a really new experience for me. I would never been out in the country like that before. There wasn't TV or anything like that. And it was so strange being somewhere where there really weren't a whole lot of people. I don't think it was the first day. But there was an area to build a fire in, and then we could all sit around it. Again, this was a new experience for me. But I found myself really enjoying it. We all sat around the fire, telling stories about when we were younger. And at one point, as always is the case when you're out camping, we started telling some scary stories to each other as well. I've always been a fan of scary stories, so I was really enjoying it. Well, we talked really late into the night. There were six of us all together. And as the night got later and later, the group sort of thinned out as one by one people would go back to the cabin to get some sleep. At one point, I was the only one left around the fire. I had been enjoying it so much and, and feeling a little scared, actually. I just wasn't eager to have it end. I can't tell you how long I sat out there in front of that fire, just watching the flames jump, listening to the crackling of the fire and the other noises that were coming out of the woods. At the time, I really didn't know what was making those noises, but I guess it was crickets and frogs. Of course, the fire was dominating the scene, but I was still looking around at the surroundings. It was amazing how dark it could be. I was looking up at the sky, seeing the Milky Way for the first time. Then as I looked down back at the fire, I jumped because I saw somebody, a huge silhouette of a person, standing off outside of the circle in the woods. I couldn't see him that well, but I immediately knew it was not one of my friends. None of my friends were that huge. And he was holding something, but it was hard to tell in the dark. I kind of thought it was a baseball bat or something like that. Hey man, <laughs> you scared me, I said with a little bit of a chuckle. The man didn't move. You want to come sit by the fire? I offered to him. He still didn't move. I was trying to be friendly, of course, but he wasn't receptive to it, obviously. I was really concerned. I mean, I almost felt like I was actually in a real horror movie here. I had no idea what I was supposed to do. And then, the guy steps forward. He came close to the circle. I don't think I mentioned this before, but the fire area was surrounded by these rocks. I didn't understand it at the time, but I guess that was there to keep the fire from spreading. The guy moved forward, like I said. And as he did, I could confirm he was carrying a bat. Other than that, though, he looked completely normal. I know a scary story would have him looking all funky and stuff like that, but this was real. It wasn't a horror movie. He got up to the circle, and with a force that I really wouldn't have thought was possible, he kicked one of the big rocks that was part of the circle that surrounded the fire. He kicked it right into the fire. He must have been wearing steel-toed boots or something like that. Because my guess is that would have hurt otherwise. I jumped back from my sitting position. I started yelling for my friends. As I did, the man kicked one of the other rocks into the fire as well. I jumped up, about to run into the cabin. But two of my friends came running out of the cabin. One of them had one of those pokers that you use for a fireplace. My two friends were big guys, but they were nothing at all compared to the guy that was kicking rocks into the fire. But as he saw them coming, he kicked a third rock and then turned and ran off into the woods. 
my friend Brad, the one who had the poker, who was also a big tough jock type, started to run after the guy, yelling and screaming at him. But it wasn't a true pursuit, and after a few moments he gave up and came back to the fire. When I explained what happened to them, it was so surreal. I have no idea who the man was. I had no idea why he was acting like that, and absolutely no idea why he was kicking rocks into the fire. It was the strangest and scariest situation. Oh, we called the sheriff. We had to use a radio to do it since they didn't have a phone there. And they sent someone out to look around. He had an idea of who it was that did it. There was a hermit in the area. And the hermit didn't like it when tourists would come and stay in the cabins. He assured us that he would take care of it and speak to the guy. For the rest of the time that we were at the cabin, the guy never came back. But that really didn't help. I was so nervous the entire time. I kept looking over my shoulder. I kept looking into the dark of the woods. I was always expecting to see that silhouette of that huge man carrying that bat and being absolutely terrified of what he might do next. But I never saw him again. When we eventually left the cabin and went home, I just took that scary memory with me. Number two, walking. This isn't a long story and it's probably gonna seem a little odd. I didn't grow up out in the country, but a lot of my family lived there. I had two uncles who were actually around my own age. So when I was younger and we visited, we would tend to do things with them. I remember being like six or seven years old and we went out hiking one time. The ground was just completely covered in leaves. One of my uncles told me that the hill that we were on was the site of some sort of war or battle between Native Americans and early settlers. He told us that the Native Americans that died were buried in the very ground that we were walking on. And then he told us that sometimes they reach out from under the leaves and grab people's legs. Being an impressionable seven-year-old, of course I was scared out of my mind. I was running to get off that hill, but every step into the leaves crunching scared the crap out of me. And this story stuck with me for a long time, so whenever I was going around, walking, hiking in the woods, I was always really careful about where I stepped. This incident also takes place on a fall day. As normal, I was walking along, my feet crunching on the leaves. The Native American battle feet grabbing story was still in my mind. So I was very careful watching where I was going. But even with how careful I was, that didn't stop me from making a big mistake. Suddenly, as I stepped down, I felt an incredibly bad pain in my ankle. Looking down, looking down, I was terrified to see a snake had bitten my ankle and was holding on to it. I reflexively kicked, trying to get the snake off my ankle. It did let go and then retreated. I learned later that that's something that venomous snakes do anyways. I fell to the ground paralyzed in fear. I was out by myself. I didn't know what to do. So I did the only thing I could think of doing. I started running back to the house. As I did, I had all those thoughts in my mind of the dead bodies grabbing me through the leaves. Every step I took was pain in my ankle, but every step I took was also fear. Fear that I would step on something else that would hurt me even more. It was a completely terrifying run. I got back to my grandma's house, crying and screaming. My grandma, my dad, my mom, they all came out on the back porch when they heard me. I had to explain what happened. 
and described the snake. I was bitten by a copperhead. Rather than call an ambulance, they put me in the car and drove me very fast to the hospital. Fortunately, I didn't get seriously injured at all. Interestingly enough, something I didn't know at the time, copperhead venom isn't really that dangerous. And in fact, copperheads are known to sort of give warning bites if they're stepped on. They don't always inject venom on the first bite, and sometimes it's just a little venom. I was completely fine, if not just a little sore, but the worst part was the fear. I was already terrified of walking on leaves because of that story my uncle told me, but now I was terrified of stepping on snakes, so walking just became very scary. Number three, the river was alive. First of all, I would like to wish Killer Orange Cat a very happy birthday on May 23rd, 2021. And I'm sure that other subscribers wish you the same. And thank you. And for your birthday, my early birthday gift to you is one scary story of mine. At the time, it was a brilliant June 1st morning. I was to be getting an early surprise gift because my birthday is June 5th. My family and I lived at the time in what I called a podunk, nowhere little country town, 20 miles from civilization. Though I love the country, I hated this part of it. My soon-to-be 10-year-old mind, when I was still 9, and about to graduate from a single digit to a double-digit age, which was a big deal to me at the time because I could lord it over my two younger sisters, was convinced that the only three things besides my human family that was worth it, was my long-haired, black-and-white tuxedo cat, Boots, so named because of the white knee-high boots he wore, my strawberry roan Appaloosa named Shandy, and fishing. My Appaloosa was fourteen and a fourth hands in height, and was covered in speckles of all sizes. They were a mix of black, gray, and tawny red, to pink that covered her entire pale white coat that only the most famous artist of them all, nature, could make. I've always hated the color pink, but in her case, I was willing to make an exception. And because I loved to fish, my family, all eight members, would often fish together for family closeness and safety. On this occasion, however, my early birthday fishing party was made up of my parents my brother, myself, and Shandy. The fishing spot where we were going was but a short distance from home, so I rode Shandy over to the narrow, muddy, watered river that we had previously fished. My dad drove my mother and elder brother in his green black top El Camino, just slow enough for me to ride Shandy close behind and keep in sight. My dad drove my mother and elder brother in his green black top El Camino, just slow enough for me to ride Shandy close behind and keep in sight. Shandy was three at the time and loved to run, so I was more than willing to oblige her as we rode our way down the dirt road to the river. Because I was a professed tomboy, I shunned wearing dresses and pretending, unlike the other girls, that I was afraid of everything. I, unlike them, wasn't afraid to climb trees to watch a glimpse of a bird nest or get close enough to watch birds like cardinals, robin wrens, red tails, hawks, of course, sparrows or blue jays, which we called robber jays, because of their territoriality and being known for robbing other birds' nests. Blue jays could easily be identified audibly because of their incessant screaming and visually because of their blue, black, and white checked plumage. They were a large bird, noticeably aggressive and roosted in gangs. They sported a blue crest and long blue and black checkered tail. I remembered once a group I had gotten a little too close to began attacking me while I was perched high up on a branch looking into one of their nests. The nest had three little hatchlings. One or two of the defenders kept pecking and scratching at my hair and clothes while the others were dive-bombing my head 
all the while screaming, Get the hell out of our tree! Apparently they were trying to knock me off the limb. I remember yelling out, I just wanted to look. Well, even if they could have understood me, they would have none of it. As the screaming got louder and the attacks more dire, eventually I shimmied back down, while being showered with blue jay epithets like idiot or moron or dim-witted human. Of course, I didn't take it personally. They were robber jays after all. The operative word being robber, and they probably thought I was one too, only bigger. No, it was more like the boys. I liked playing baseball. I was the pitcher. Getting muddy and playing with frogs and toads, sometimes even snakes. I loved the beautiful satin green and gold fig bugs, which we called June bugs, praying mantises, dragonflies, that would perch themselves on the tip of one finger, you know, etc. I was taught and believed that nature was to be observed, but above all else, respected, which meant do no harm. So for me, I took these outings, especially with Shandy, as more than an opportunity. They were a special gift meant just for me. What was also special is that my parents seemed to inherently know it and proved it on more than one occasion. I knew they loved and respected me for it, especially since my actual birthday was still a few days off. As we slowly moved forward, and just before crossing the one-lane bridge that spanned the narrow muddy river, Shandy balked and snorted. I leaned forward with my right hand and stroked her quivering, speckled neck to soothe her. I peered between her ears and spoke softly to calm her and urge her. She'd been here before, and she'd been fine with it then. But this time, she didn't seem to want to be there at all. As she cautiously moved forward, I thought of the ancient Arabian proverb, The wind of heaven is that which blows between a horse's ears. From Shandy's back, I could see the telltale tree trunk off to my left. The trunk served as sort of a marker for our fishing spot. Because Shandy was nervous, I decided to examine the tree trunk from a safe distance. As before, I could see the distinct hollowing out of the tree, obscured by the deep black shadow of the early morning sun. Cautiously, I nudged Shandy closer. I noticed that there appeared to be something down in the hollow of the tree. It was a huge cotton mouth, otherwise known as a water moccasin. Its enormous coils were wrapped around parts of the inside of the core, and the tree to enable it to hold on and defend itself, but from what we didn't know. It had coiled itself, where its body had filled the hollow of the trunk, and its head was resting on a piece of jutting wood, like a pillow. We thought it had positioned itself in such a way as to maximize defense against an attacker. At first glance, it looked like it was sleeping. Fortunately for me and all of us present, it was dead. But of what we never knew. What was particularly alarming was that it appeared as though it had just died. There were no flies and no smell of rotting flesh. But after my dad thoroughly examined it with a stick, lifting it enough to know that there was no response, and fell over backwards. We were sure. All of us took this as an omen meeting. Watch out. But what to watch out for was still unknown. Either way, the trunk had become its coffin, so we left it in peace. Throughout the day, and after stalling Shandy with her previous owner who owned the land that we were fishing on, it turned out that this was once again a good fishing spot because of the number of fish and the variety caught. There were catfish, crappies, sunfish, sheephead, known for their sterling silver color. Fought and caught by all of us it was a very nice early birthday gift. Towards the close of the day, my mother had just caught another crappie, and pulling out the stringer, she gasped at what turned out to be a cottonmouth, having swallowed one of our fish halfway up its length, and was hanging on outstretched in the air. She let out an involuntary yelp, back jumped about twenty feet, and ran to me. My mother was one of those strong, southern, Native American women that seldom explain themselves in words. They used to look, instead of say, do it or else. To her, words were a last resort 
reserved for the denser among us, which proved to run more on the male side of the family. I imagine that look now, when she saw the cotton mouth attached to our catch, and what it meant about whether any of the fish caught up to that point were worth the risk. The answer was no. They all had to be thrown back. For all of my mother's strengths, her only apparent weaknesses were snakes, or things in the shape of snakes like worms. She was deathly afraid of them. Afraid, not in the sense of a mind-numbing, body-paralyzing fear, but an uncharacteristic raging anger that would inevitably result in the death of the thing itself. Her anger wasn't due to a half-day's catch having to be thrown back, but rather because she did not like snakes of any kind, period. And everyone has a weakness. Hers were snakes. I even had to bait her hook, because of the shape of earthworms resembling the shape of snakes. Once my mother had reflexively dropped the stringer, the snake fortunately let go, because otherwise she would have killed it, especially if she had been armed with her trusty hoe. Hence her flower and vegetable garden bore no survivors. Regrettingly, my dad began the process of examining all the stringers we had fish on and letting them all go. My brother, angry that all the fish caught that day were lost, decided to shoot with my mother's 22 cal rifle at a copperhead. He saw it crossing the river towards where we were fishing. The woods which lined the opposite bank were thick with poplar trees, and along the river proved to be the perfect habitat for cottonmouths and copperheads. Stupidly, he thought this would dissuade any other snakes from getting too close to where we were fishing. It was a good shot, but the kill had the opposite effect. It set off a chain reaction where within minutes the surface of the water was undulating with the bodies of hundreds of snakes moving in to claim the kill. And most people do have a natural aversion to snakes, especially the venomous kind, and I was no different. At first I cringed at the sight of so many, and even tried desperately to look away, but the copper, gray, white, pink, and yellowish colors shining in the sunlight, along with their roiling movements, had me spellbound. My brother, also in a kind of shock, eventually pulled himself away when Mother shouted for all of us to get out of there. As the minutes went by, we all witnessed snakes in the surrounding trees plop into the water and slither in. It was deadly surreal, the peaceful quiet of the location, broken only by the eerie sound of snakes falling into the muddy water. The little pitch of the river that we had been fishing for almost the whole day soon filled with hundreds of cottonmouths and copperheads. Whether they were reacting to my brother's kill or because, as I thought, they were simply starving, we never knew. And suffice to say, our fishing spot was, for us, gone forever. We never went back. And nonetheless, when I think about all the incidents that led up to the shooting of the snake and our having to abandon our catch, I especially considered all of us to have been uniquely blessed that day, and that nothing serious had happened to any of us. We saw the signs, and most of us listened. Apparently to my brother, vengeance was foremost on his mind. He either didn't see the signs, or chose to ignore them. He honestly believed that the snakes had ruined our, or his, catch, and to him, the one snake that had the audacity to appear to be coming at us, he felt was justified to be killed. He thought it would send a message to the others not to follow. They didn't. We learned, however, what was meant about the sign of the dead snake in the tree trunk, and that was, do no harm. But for the shooting, we should have left the entire area in peace. That was one early birthday gift I'll never forget. Hey y'all, Kill the Orange Cat here. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, please feel free to click the subscribe button and bell below, or click the icon of Ichigo the Cat that will appear at the end of this closing. Leave me a comment, and share this video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have an original story you'd like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. But most importantly, 
don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.